Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, my beloved brethren and sistren, to the Tawahado Bible Study Podcast. Today, we are entering the second chapter of the first scroll of John. In other words, 1 John 2. So we are in this non-Pauline area of the epistles, uh, at least allegedly, and we are going through the Janin or the Yanin literature. As a reminder, if you have not already, please subscribe to this program, whether you find it on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Google, Transistor, or Anchor. And if you like the information that you find here, share the biblical text with your beloved, with strangers, with enemies, copy and paste the podcast to them, whatever it may be. And if you have the means, donate. You can find us at patreon.com slash tawahado, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. I switch versions sometimes, and it's uh, sometimes to switch around in terms of variety being the spice of life. Sometimes it's to avoid so-called intellectual property. There are many reasons. Anyway, what I haven't used in a long time is that which is in the public domain, which is something I could use every time, the King James Version. Now, part of that is it's more difficult for me to read. It's more difficult for you to hear. But if we're being honest with ourselves, the vast majority of the beauty that is in the English language, the idiomatic language, originates from the King James Version. So some scholars have issues with this translation versus other translations like the New King James Version or perhaps the RSV or the ESV, which are all in that general tradition of English language translations that come from committees, but you know, they're rendered better. I've also used the Kingdom New Testament, which is a, a more thought for thought translation, uh, more on the extreme side of that from N.T. Wright, a Protestant scholar I respect. I've also used David Bentley Wright, a controversial Orthodox scholar who I don't agree with uh, a lot, you know, of his uh, Platonic or Neoplatonic theology, but you cannot deny the beauty of English he uses. He's one of the people who regularly sends me to dictionaries, and he has an edition of the New Testament as well that is not committee, just like N.T. Wright has his own individual. He has his own individual New Testament translation, similar to Robert Alter's work with the Hebrew Bible or the Older Testament. And in David Bentley Hart's New Testament, it goes the opposite direction of N.T. Wright. It's an individual who says, let me make it as word for word as, as possible, as he sees the, the brutish Greek, as he refers to it, to be. In any event, today is the King James Version, 1 John chapter 2, without further ado, verses 1 to 2. My little children, these things are write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. For those of you who are in the Greek tradition, you may not have heard of this controversy, but there was a recent controversy a few years ago while well, there was a split in the synods in the Gizrite amongst the Ethiopians. And this verse in particular is translated in two major ways in a synodal stamped Bible that was released in the 1980s uh, versus the synodal stamped Bible of the 2000s when there was a split. Notably in the 80s, there was no split. In the 2000s, when that edition of the Bible came out, there was indeed some issues going on. So in the 80s, they translate this word paraklitos, right? Paraklitos in a more good accent. Uh, the Greek word here being used often, which is translated in other places, I should say transliterated as paraclete, Right, it's a, a term people usually associate with the Holy Spirit, both in English and in Giz and in Greek. Right, but the Greek is actually quite versatile. So, in the 1980s Amharic Bible from the Undivided Synod, they translate this word with no issue as what could be considered advocate or lawyer, and that's one of the roles that Jesus Christ plays through His labor of love for us, when one time for all time for all peoples. 
right? He gives this propitiation, this rescuing, this delivery, this salvation from his precious blood. And he does it one time and it intercedes on our behalf. And this intercession, this mediation, right, which is talked about in Hebrews, which is talked about in Romans, which is talked about in 1 John, is uncomfortable for certain Ethiopians who have gone on the extreme deep end almost of Eutychianism, of what people were genuinely calling monophysitism, where they believe that Jesus is only divine, that there's no humanity in him, right? And so it's hard for them to come to grips with the incarnation. And so because they have issues with the incarnation, they are having issues with Jesus being called an advocate or a lair. They just want him to be called not an attorney or a judge or an advocate or an intercessor or a mediator, but just a judge, just a judge. And they have an issue in, in Romans that we'll get to when we get to Romans 8.34. But in any event here, the issue they have is the word paraklitos, which is here in the King James Version translated as advocate in the 1980s Amharic Bible translated as the equivalent of advocate. And in the 2000s Amharic Bible, what the tricky folks did is they just transliterated the word paraklitos so that they did not have to define it. In other key passages, the same committee, which was very corrupt, that we found in um, in Romans and in Galatians and in other places, when they find issues, they'll say, this is what we said. And then in the footnotes, hoping that nobody is going to read, but wanting to not lie to people who are going to examine the evidence upon history, say the Greek says this. And they know, you know, surely that the Ge'ez or Amharic are not the languages of the original scripture. They're helpful. It's always helpful to get this understanding, especially from Semitic languages like Ge'ez and Amharic. But the meaningful language of the Newer Testament is Greek. And so the Greek is paraklitos and it has multiple meanings. And often in the New Testament, it is referring to the Holy Spirit, right? Capital S, you know, remember capitals don't exist in the Greek. There's no distinction between capital and lowercase. But in this instance, in 1 John, a word that, or a title that's often used of the Holy Spirit is used for Jesus. And, you know, this may confuse people in terms of Trinitarian thought and all that. The important point is that this is intentional. The interplay between the archangel Michael and with God, whom he serves in the Old Testament, the interplay between the Holy Spirit and Jesus, they're there for a reason. There are similarities there. Uh, obviously, the Michael one is different than the, the Holy Spirit one, but there are similarities here. And in this case, I think it's pretty uncontroversial that paraklitos means an intercessor, a mediator, an advocate, a lawyer who not is is not bowing down to the father right now or something silly like that right that we would find offensive as orthodox no it is about a specific act which is his crucifixion which was his loving submission unto death for the propitiation of sins forever for everyone end of story verses 3 to 6 and hereby we do not know that excuse me and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments he that saith i know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him but whoso keepeth this word in him verily is the love of god perfected hereby know we that we are in him he that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So here we see knowledge and we see walking, both of which reminds us of the knowledge of good and evil and the walking of Enoch, both of which are found in Genesis, in the beginning. And there was a lack of obedience in the garden there was a lack of obedience in Genesis, and we need to learn from that lack of obedience and gain the knowledge of obedience, learn to walk in obedience. All right. Um, you know, the longest sign of the cross you can make, right, as high up 
as low, low, as far left, and as far right is not what means you are an Orthodox Christian. By that means, for those who try to short circuit the sign of the cross and make it as short as possible, and they're just going through the motions, that also doesn't mean you have some sort of freedom in Christ. If you have tears for an altar call, that does not mean you're the best Christian. If you have tears when you hear the liturgy, that doesn't mean you're the best Christian. You are the best Orthodox Christian when you have the knowledge of God, when you are walking in God. In other words, when you are obedient to the commandments that he has given you. Let's get a little bit more into them. 7 to 11. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. We are blind without the word of God. We are invited to reread Bar Ashit. We are invited to reread in the beginning. We are invited to reread Genesis. In chapter 4 of Genesis, we come across the first fratricide in humanity. That is brother murdering brother. We extrapolate from that anti-brotherly love, that anti-Philadelphia, right? The city of brotherly love in Pennsylvania is named after one of the cities in Revelation, in John's Revelation, which we will get to. And Philadelphia is brotherly love. That is the kinonia or the table fellowship we should be following. And its opposite is brotherly hate, is fratricide, which is the ultimate result of brotherly hate. So we extrapolate from Cain murdering Abel that no human being should be functionally like Cain in that story. We should not be a city dweller naming cities after our first sons and be jealous of the shepherd in the wilderness to the point where we go and murder them. So we extrapolate to all of humankind and especially the household of God that hatred is forbidden, that God's commandment to us is to not hate. Christianity or one's orthodoxy can only be verified by the love of so-and-so. You cannot say, I hate so-and-so. Anytime you say, I hate so-and-so, it is a negation of the Christianity that you ascribe to yourself. If you self-identify as orthodox, you cannot say, I hate so-and-so. You must say, I love so-and-so, or I am trying my best to love so-and-so, or so help me God, I will love so-and-so. Verses 12 to 20. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the father. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that this is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. 
but ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Unction here reminiscent of the mystery of unction as we talked about in the scroll of James or the scroll of Jacob, this holy oil, this anointing, right? That God chooses people to be prophets and priests and kings, but all beneath him and the perfect prophet, the perfect priest and the perfect king is our Lord and our savior, Jesus, who is the Christ and the Christ is in contradistinction and opposition and an adversarial nature with the anti-Christ. There are these dichotomies, these binaries, these two choices. You have the world and you have the church. You have light and you have dark. You have the wicked or the unholy and you have the holy. You have the Christ and you have the antichrist. And you are given the chance to make a decision. You are given the chance to obey one or to obey the other. What you cannot do is attempt to obey both. The associate deacon reads aloud or recites the non-Pauline epistles in the liturgical rubric of the Gizrite, and particularly verse 15 is said no matter what after all of his readings. It's what we always say. We say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. People know to cue in and sing as soon as they hear the associate deacon saying that because they know that his reading has culminated. And it's so powerful that we've taken that piece of the biblical text and incorporated it into the liturgy to say that we have re-emphasized these particular words means we need to understand what does it mean to be the world? What is the cosmos? What is it that we're talking about? What is this team? And how do we oppose this team, which is with Christ? The way we oppose this team is through obedience. It is very common to find disobedience, and it is very uncommon to find obedience. So ignore the lips. When I was a dispute resolution specialist in cross-cultural navigation, we talk about high context cultures and low context cultures. I'm gonna give you some insight and wisdom from high context cultures that will help us be in greater obedience. In low context cultures, everything is spelled out, everything is explicit, everything is straightforward. In the context of the United States, New York and Boston are considered very low context and everything is spelled out. In the context of the United States, the high context cultures would be the Midwest and the South, where first, before you get into business deals, you better sit down, you better talk some small talk, you better pour them some tea, whether it be sweet tea or, or something else, and maybe you'll go down to the creek with them, but you gotta figure something out. In the Ethiopian context, the low context cultures are in Harar, Harar and Diredawa, where people are very direct and to an extent Addis Ababa, the capital city. And the highest context are considered the northern areas, Gwajam, Gwander, Shoa, Wallo, and Tigray, but most stereotypically Gwander, where people speak very indirectly, where you're not sure what's going on. And the ultimate point of this can also be understood from some of the Marxist communist societies like the Stalinist Russia, which I learned from the great Michael Malice, which is this saying, ignore the lips, right? You can ignore the lips of the presidents of the United States when they say, read my lips, I will not cut taxes. You could ignore the lips of people propagandized in Stalinist Russia or in the Juchi system of North Korea or in the current system of Eritrea or in the high context societies of the Midwest and in the South, you have to be a little bit more careful. Things are less direct. And so we have to be with the character of people that we see who self-identify as Christians, but most especially with ourselves. When we self-identify with Christians, we have to have distrust of our own lips. And we have to be able in a neutral fashion to almost astro project out of outside of ourselves to get a third eye view and say, are we actually being obedient to the Holy One or have we 
joined the side of the Antichrist. Verses 21 to the end. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. He that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, he, uh, we may have confidence, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. So I'm always going to call this out when I see this. Another thing from a rubric, this time not from a liturgical rubric, but from the rubric of the daily prayers of the good is right. Every time we're done eating the meal we uh, together, we say a prayer called Sibhat, which means glory. And uh, one of the first few lines of the Sibhat or the glory prayer is Amadagam mazatu iyastaha faranna. When he comes again, let us be unashamed, or as it is phrased here in the King James Version, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So he's already come once. That's Christmas. That's nativity. That's his first birth. His second coming is for judgment. And that's the ominous way in which chapter 2 ends, is with this invitation to have confidence in the judgment of Christ when you are obedient to him. You have to be careful of false teachers who are here likened to seductresses. They are sirens calling out to you for aesthetic pleasures to tickle your ears, as Paul will say in Timothy. But we need to not enjoy the tickling of our ears or of our fancies. We need to ignore the calls of the sirens and put our foots down and say, get behind me, seductress, to the false teachers. We need to remain loyal. We do not need to be disloyal to Elohim Yahweh, to the Lord God. And our faithfulness is primarily engendered. We increase our faithfulness. We increase our loyalty by consuming scripture every single day, hopefully as often as we consume earthly food. Glory to God for all things.